Welcome to this national conversation on white supremacy and American Christianity, live from the National Press Club in downtown Washington, D.C. We are so pleased that you are joining us today. We have nearly a thousand people from all over the country in this live conversation. You'll see our Twitter feed on the right of your screen. Join the conversation with hashtag BJC Luncheon and hashtag White Too Long. In addition to many longstanding friends of BJC, we welcome new friends who might be learning of our work for Faith Freedom for All for the first time today. For more than 80 years, BJC has advocated for religious freedom and the separation of the institutions of religion and government as the best way to protect that freedom for all people, those who claim a faith tradition and those who don't. From our offices on Capitol Hill, we work in Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the executive branch to uphold our country's founding principles that protect the free exercise of religion and prohibit the establishment of religion by government. We come at our work from a Baptist Christian perspective and experience, and our community of supporters and partners includes Baptists and others who share our mission. I hope you will learn more about us and join us in our work at bjconline.org. We initially planned today's gathering as an in-person event. Our annual luncheon held each summer in coordination with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship General Assembly. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to shift the event to this online conversation, which has allowed us to welcome more people to this event than ever before. I want to thank the people who made today's gathering possible. First, a thank you to our event sponsor, Patsy Ayers, who generously supported today's event and did so in memory of Bab Spa, a beloved member of the BJC community who passed away on June 14th. Thank you also to our virtual table sponsors who made this event possible. You can see the names of these individuals, churches, and organizational partners on your screen now. I also want to thank the entire BJC team, and in particular, Dan Hamill, Danielle Tyler, Sherilyn Crow, and Chris Kearns McCoy, who worked so hard to make today's event a first ever virtual event for BJC come together. And finally, a special thank you to Robert P. Jones and Adele Banks, who will be speaking to us in just a moment. Joy Reed sends her regrets for not being able to join us due to a last minute scheduling conflict. And now I welcome Barry Black, chaplain to the United States Senate, to give our invocation. It is my honor to be able to offer this invocation for this virtual luncheon. Let us pray. Eternal God, author of liberty, only with you can we experience true freedom. Lord, we thank you for this virtual luncheon and for the 84 years that the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty has protected faith freedom for the multitudes. Lord, remind us that our liberty does not come from socio-political documents but is a gift from you. Thank you for giving us a right to freedoms such as liberty, happiness, speech, assembly, and worship. We praise you for the freedom to live a life of faith as salt and light in a sometimes cynical world. Lord, give us the wisdom to defend our threatened freedoms, depending always on the power of your loving and prevailing providence. Remind us that you love us so much that you want what is best for us. You are so wise that you know what is best for us and you are so powerful that you can bring about what is best for us. 
May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts always receive the approbation of heaven. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. We are fortunate to have two distinguished guests with us today for a national conversation on white supremacy and American Christianity. Both are known for their professional excellence, so we are in good hands to take on such a heavy topic. I trust that the conversation will encourage all of us to think about what shapes us and what that means for the world we live in today as we continue the conversations beyond our time together. Adele Banks is an award-winning journalist who has worked for Religion News Service since 1995. She currently serves as production editor and national reporter, and her work has been published in a wide range of publications. In addition to reporting on religion and race, Ms. Banks is also a photographer and occasional videographer. Her multimedia talent was widely acclaimed for a project she spearheaded marking the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Ms. Banks grew up in Newport, Rhode Island, which is a fact that this religious freedom audience should appreciate. She is a graduate of Mount Holyoke College. When asked what she liked most about her work, Adele told me she likes passing on what she learns from interviews to foster better understanding related to religion and other topics. We appreciate you helping us with that work today. Dr. Robert P. Jones is the CEO and founder of PRRI, Public Religion Research Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. He holds a PhD in religion from Emory University, an MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a BS in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. Robbie is an accomplished scholar and an author, including the author of the award-winning book, The End of White Christian America, which documents and explains the massive transformation in the religious landscape in the past decade. That transformation has had and continues to have a major impact on public opinion and policy. Today, we are glad to be together for the first live public event to talk about his new forthcoming book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. While this book also includes some very significant social science research, it is more personal and historical. It is full of stories that explore family, politics, and race, as well as the major impact of Southern Baptist. I was fortunate to review an advanced copy, and I can say that it is a deeply interesting and in many ways challenging book to read as I know it was a challenging book to write, and I highly recommend it. I do so because I firmly believe that it is crucial that we all stop to think about what we learned and didn't learn growing up inside and outside of church and how that continues to shape and affect us all. The book is not out yet, but it will be soon. Um, it is available for pre-sale on Amazon now with a delivery date of July 28th, and it's been recently discounted. Of course, if it were not for the coronavirus, we would all be lining up to get signed copies in person. Um, because we are not able to do that, the publisher has set up a virtual book signing option for those who pre-order and request it by email. We are glad to provide that information to all of you. Thank you, Robbie for sharing your work and this time with us. Now I'll turn it over to Adele. Hi, it's nice to see you today, Robbie. Thank you for inviting me to ask you questions. Oh, well, thanks for coming. Yeah. You are known as the founder of PRRI, Public Religion Research Institute, but your new book reflects not only your professional side, but your personal side. You grew up in the South, and you had experiences with racial division and racial tension. So can you talk a little bit about 
a few of the remembrances of that time and when and where you were. Mm, yeah. No, you're right. This book's a little bit different uh, than a book you know I've written in the past. Um, and I'm at the same time wearing kind of the social science hat. And that's part of what drove me to write the book is seeing patterns in the data, for example, that, that white Christians were very consistently um, further away from African-American attitudes on all kinds of racial justice issues than whites who are unaffiliated. Um, and so seeing that pattern over and over, not just in one question, uh, over and over. Um, and then my own experience of growing up, I grew up Southern Baptist in Jackson, Mississippi for the most part. And then my family goes back uh, six generations on both sides to middle Georgia, uh, Bibb County, Twiggs County, uh, so Macon, Georgia is where both my parents grew up. So we have this deep affiliation and Baptist all the way back. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the Baptist Joint Committee having me today. And in some ways, I know we have a much broader audience, uh, but uh, we have a core audience of people who are, they're, they're my people, right, uh, where I grew up. And, you know, one of the things that after seeing this, it really, this book has really been a personal journey. And I, I thought back and, and one of the things I did after seeing all this data and thought, like, I need to really dig into this. Like, what's going on, right, that in 2019 we're seeing this kind of disparity and that Christianity seems to be playing not a mitigating role. Um, on issues of racial justice, but actually one that puts more distance between white people and their African-American brothers and sisters. What's happening there? So one of the things I did is I kind of went back and looked at uh, my own growing up and just spent a little bit of time um, trying to let stories come back. Where did race like erupt into my consciousnesses, uh, consciousness? Um, and, you know, just a couple stories. Like one is, so I grew up in, in elementary school in the 1970s. Um, and I remember the first African-American kids coming to our school. Now, Brown v. Board of Education is the mid-1950s, so it took nearly 20 years, right, for that to really become a reality in the Mississippi that I grew up in. Um, you know, those kinds of memories um, I saw, um, again, as late as the late 1970s, uh, the KKK um, handing out literature and taking donations, standing on the corner at Battlefield Park in Jackson, Mississippi, where we played soccer. Uh, so as we took a left turn into the soccer fields, we had to pass like this demonstration. Again, this is late 1970s. It's not uh, there. Um, we, we, our soccer team had a, a, a party at, and we were going to have a swimming party at the Moose Lodge and we had to cancel at the last, mi last minute because we found out that they wouldn't allow us to come because we had African-American kids on our, on our team. And through all of that, I mean, I was at church five times a week growing up. I was that kid, right? Went twice on Sunday, we had Monday visitation, we had Tuesday Bible study, we had a Wednesday prayer meeting. I was there all the time. Uh, and I, one of the striking things I think in sitting with this is I heard virtually nothing about racial justice, um, about what we might owe to African Americans, about the role that white Christians had played in slavery, segregation, uh, tearing down Reconstruction, uh, right after the Civil War, none of that. There was just a, a deafening silence. And this is a silence that Martin Luther King, um, you know, criticized Southern churches for having. And yeah. it seems like you're saying that silence is still. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the, us. case in point, right? So I, I went to um, Mississippi College, Baptist College. I have a degree from a, a Southern Baptist Seminary. But it wasn't until I was at Emory University in my 20s that I read a letter from uh, Birmingham Jail. Right. And, and, and when I did, it was exactly this. This, I mean, King talks about people um, sitting, you know, anesthetized behind their stained glass windows. Right. And that was exactly my experience growing up. And so that was that experience and seeing the continued patterns in the public opinion data today. It was really those two things that pushed me, I think, to try to, you know, one way to boil it down is just really try to tell the truth um, about where the church has been and the legacy of where the church has been that is still very much with us today. Before we get into some of the statistics and your research, um, I want to ask you about the phrase white supremacy. Yeah. You say that that can actually soothe rather than prick the com consciences of white Christians. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think it, it's a challenge and um, that one of the things I've experienced personally when trying to talk to people about this is if you bring up white supremacy, what many, if you think about like a white middle class person who's going to a Baptist church and giving their tithes and offerings and, you know, uh, is that's not me, right? That's the first hands go up, not me. Um, and be that's because I think that has, that is really associated very easily with, oh, that's just the, that is those people on the corner in their hoods. Um, you know, that's, that's what white supremacy is. But I think we've got to get well beyond that. And it doesn't take that much work, but that is the knee-jerk defensive reaction, I think, among, among most whites. But if we just flip the words around, um, the supremacy of whites, and you really think about American history, um, 
it's not that hard to see how society has been set up that way, right? Everything from restrictive neighborhood uh, real estate uh, requirements uh, to mass incarceration, differential sentencing requirements, or even something as recent as today, looking at COVID-19, right? If you look at the rates, uh, African-Americans far more likely because they're in at-risk jobs uh, that have to be face-to-face. -face. Um, also health disparities. Um, and there's a pullout today that just shows, for example, African-Americans are three times as likely as whites to know someone who has died of COVID-19. Now, those aren't accidents. Those are the results of really centuries of structural injustice built into our institutions and our psyches. So one of the questions you hope to answer in your book was how prevalent are racist and white supremacist attitudes among white Christians today? And you used what you call a racism index. Um, so what did you determine? Yeah, well, one of the tricky things about public opinion data and sensitive questions like racism uh, is that you can't just straightforwardly ask people, right? You can't say, well, do you consider yourself a racist or not, right? You, you know what kinds of answers you're gonna get from those kinds of questions. So one of the things we um, try to do um, with public opinion research is not rely on one question, not rely on even a question of self-identification that's right on point. Um, but what we did is we built um, is, uh, this, what I call a racism index in the, in the book. This built actually of 15 separate questions, all right, that covers things like institutional racism, things like uh, policies, uh, things like Confederate monuments, like a whole range of things. And then uh, using some statistical methods, we build them into one composite index. So that, that way one question isn't playing too much of an outlier role um, there. And when we put that together, what we essentially found um, is that there is a strong relationship between white Christian identity. And I should be clear here too that, so I grew up evangelical, Baptist, uh, but what I think, one of the things that I saw in the book and that I had seen in patterns but confirmed in the, in the research is that this is not an evangelical, not just a white evangelical problem. This is a white Catholic problem, and this is a white mainline Protestant problem, right? And, and that, that we saw among all three of these groups, even when you control for a whole range of other characteristics like partisanship uh, or region of the country, uh, that we still see a positive independent relationship between holding more racist attitudes and white Christian identity when compared to whites who are unaffiliated. And that again, that goes for both white Catholics and white mainliners and white evangelicals. And was there something you found out about regions too, that even though people have this image of this being a Southern issue yeah. more than anywhere else, that maybe that's not always the case? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, what we found is that there has been, a, um, because of the way that um, Christian churches have sorted themselves over time, there's a regionalism here. So white evangelicals more dominant in the Southeast, um, white mainline Protestants and white Catholics kind of share the space in the Northeast white mainliners more in the upper Midwest. Uh, and, and actually on the, on the West Coast, it's really more the unaffiliated uh, there. But, but when you look down at the, at the regional levels, what you see, for example, is that white Catholics and white mainline churches in the Northeast really became, um, in some ways, the institutional holders of racist attitudes among whites in the Northeast. In fact, the biggest gap between white unaffiliated uh, folks and white Catholics or white mainliners is in the Northeast. That's where those differences are actually the biggest. So it's a little bit of a surprise um, on the face of it. Now, if you look at the history, the institutional history, which I do unpack in the book, um, it becomes less of a surprise. Um, it's just a, kind of this um, image that we have that this is only a Southern problem or only an evangelical problem. But the problem is much deeper and much wider. And some of the research you uh, highlighted deals with events that we're dealing with right now in recent weeks. Um, and so in the wake of the death of George Floyd at mm -hmm. the hands of Minneapolis police, um, there have been governmental decisions about removing Confederate symbols and in some cases protesters taking them down. What did you find out about that in your recent research about how white evangelical Protestants, mainline Protestants, Catholics, um, say about those kinds of monuments? Yeah, so again, it, the pattern is just very clear. Um, so for example, on the killing of African men African-American men by police. We have a question right on that. It's part of this racism index we talked about in the book. Uh, but it's, it's really notable that white Christians, and not just evangelicals, but also white mainline and white Catholics, are essentially twice as likely as white unaffiliated Americans to say that the killing of African-American men are isolated incidents and not part of a broader pattern. So this inability to see structural racism is what we're really talking about. That, you know, the, the couple of bad apples is just an isolated incident. It's not a, and we've heard, you know, people from Trump to Barr to members of the president's cabinet basically saying we don't have a systematic racism problem in this country. Uh, but clearly the data shows that they have, a, that a lot of white Christians share that world, that worldview and that mindset. 
um, but it's white unaffiliated Americans. The same thing holds true on the Confederate flag. We had a lot of uh, the Mississippi Baptist Convention. We have a lot of big Baptist audience today. Uh, came out, um, you know, just um, uh, uh, last week, saying uh, earlier this week, saying uh, that they were calling for the state to remove the Confederate battle flag from the state flag. That's a big deal. But in the rank and file, the last time we asked this question last fall. Um, we found that that's not really not white Christians are. White Christians of all stripes are 30 percentage points or more, more likely to say that, that the Confederate flag is a symbol of Southern pride rather than racism uh, compared to white unaffiliated Americans. So just kind of put all that together. When you, if you ask the question on these kinds of questions, the killing of um, unarmed African American men by police, uh, the display of the Confederate flag, who is closer to African Americans on this question? It is not white Christians, it is whites who are not Christian and religiously unaffiliated. Yes, indeed. So I have to note that your book has a lot of history in it and it includes history related to the Confederacy. And I wonder if there's an example or two you could talk about how embedded those images are in churches across the country. Yeah. Well, you know, the first thing to say, the first sentence of the book um, uh, has the word I in it. So I'm, I am putting myself in the story. But, um, uh, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the, the uh, denomination I grew up in, was explicitly founded, right, um, at, uh, to, to allow missionaries to hold slaves. Like, this was the dispute between the Northern and Southern Baptists. And in 1845, um, they formed their own uh, convention. Uh, and, you know, the founders of that were some of the founders of the convention. Uh, Basil Manley Sr. Uh, was uh, not only the person who kind of pulled, was an architect of pulling the convention away from the Northern Baptists, uh, he was also the first president of Southern Seminary. He was a president of the board for 10 years at Southern Seminary. The flagship seminary. The, Southern the flagship Baptist seminary of, mm -hmm. of, of the convention. And, you know, that history, I mean, it is the founding story of our denomination, and yet, you know, growing up again, it really wasn't until I was in seminary. So I grew up going to church all this time, went to a Baptist college, and it was really not until I got into seminary that I ever confronted, you know, this truth about, um, about the country. And I, I think where this goes for me is like, what does it say um, about um, a faith that was founded by design to be compatible with slavery and white supremacy? Um, what does that mean in 2019, 2020? Uh, uh, for us today. And I think we're at a moment of reckoning in the country today where that question is getting called. Um, and I, I'm hoping one of the things the book will do is kind of help white Christians sit with that question long enough uh, so that they don't just go, oh, not me, not us, um, but really sit with this question long enough for it to sink in. Um, and when we see these patterns in the data, once you really take in the history, the question is really not, how can this be? The real, the real question is, how could this be otherwise, given the history? So as people maybe start to sit with those questions um, and hear these statistics and see the violence we've played over and over again on their screens, um, they often wonder, some do, what, what they can do. And you talked about the story of two Baptist churches in Macon, Georgia. And it had very dramatic twists and turns related to race and religion. So I wondered if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so, you know, one of the things I did was I tried to look to see what, what are people doing uh, on the ground. This is obviously very... Uh, we're talking hundreds of years of legacy, very tough work to undo, uh, to even think about um, what to do. Uh, and um, so, and I tried to keep the story close to home. So, you know, my, both my parents grew up in Macon, Georgia. Um, so briefly, uh, there are two churches and two First Baptist churches in Macon, Georgia. Um, this is not like a marketing, pro, you know, uh, escalation gone awry. I mean, they actually used to be the same church. Um, and uh, this was pre-Civil War, right? And they split um, right before the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, it used to be one church with African Americans sitting in the back and white sitting in the front. Um, then it split. They were their own church, uh, but under white leadership until after the, after the Civil War. But once that uh, got established, um, there was, you know, 150 years where there's very little interaction between these two churches with the shared history. Um, and even as they moved around, they basically have settled um, literally around the corner from each other in a not huge town, right, in Macon. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, two pastors got together, um, James Goolsby uh, at the predominantly African American church and Scott Dickinson uh, at uh, the predominantly white church and finally just said, look, what can we do, right? And began this process of community, uh, of building community um, and building accountability and in the white church in particular, owning this history, right? And really telling a truer story about, um, about their churches and what it meant. 
Um, there's a lot more in the book, uh, but I, but I, and, and I, you know, I, I want to be careful to say it, it's certainly, and I'm sure that Reverend Goolsby and Re Reverend Dickinson would want me to say this, certainly not a perfect story um, or a fairy tale, um, but it is an example of the very hard work these churches have, have done together that have changed, I think, the conversation and changed the experience, particularly, I think, in the white churches um, for uh, really trying to come to terms with, with this very, very difficult history. Uh, one part of that story is that they ended up taking basically a pilgrimage to uh, what is known as the lynching memorial or the yeah. National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And so there may be some people who aren't ready to take a pilgrimage and get on a bus with people who don't look like them, but are there other first steps that, um, given your personal experience that you have um, explained in the book, um, that you think people might take if they want to try to do things differently? Yeah, you know, I, I think some really basic stuff, I mean, <clears throat> for me, I'll just be you know, very personal here, um, it was really a, a week of journaling, right? Just sitting and letting the memories come. Because I think for most white Christians, those memories are there, but they've been pushed way, way down and sit somewhere below the level of consciousness. So just sitting long enough every day to start letting those memories come and then talking to people who were there and sharing those memories. And I think starting to tell these stories is a way of starting to tell the truth and letting them get purchase, a moral purchase, I think, on us today, right? Because if you can't tell these stories, um, you know, I think things can't can't be changed. I mean, I, I read a, a lot of James Baldwin, you know, working on this book, and um, you know, one of the things he was like really clear about and is quoted a lot about, you know, that you you can only change things that you can see and and that you can talk about. There was a provocative uh, statement that you made in the one of many in your <laughs> book, where you talked about how even basic Christian practices like focusing on a quote-unquote personal relationship with Jesus can be used to reinforce white dominance. What did you mean by that? Yeah, you know, so the real question, I think, is um, there has to be a kind of interrogation of, uh, of the faith, I think, by white Christians. Um, because, the, again, if you go back to, you know, it's not just the founding of the Southern Baptist Convention, every denomination split over the issue of slavery in the Protestant world, um, uh, and the Catholic Church has its own kind of shaky history with racial justice in the country and, and, and discrimination. So I think thinking that through, I think, is, um, you know, part of the hard work um, that, we, that, we've got, um, that we've got before us today. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Southern Baptists, and they are highlighted quite a bit in your yep. book, but I also wonder whether there's another denomination that you might point out maybe on the mainline side yep. that is something that people can think about so they don't just sort of pigeonhole this into yeah. the one area of Christianity. Sure. Well, I mean, the largest uh, pro mainline Protestant denomination is the United Methodist, uh, was today, known today as the United Methodist Church. Um, and, you know, there it, it's... Um, like notable because uh, they they split as a, into a southern a southern division and northern division of the Civil War, uh, came back together. But notably, when they came back together, um, even when they went in and, and were admitting African American churches into the denomination, they they segregated them into their own jurisdiction called the central jurisdiction. And, and that was a really weird thing to do for Methodists because it's usually a, a geo geographical sorting. Right. But they took all the African American churches and stuck them there. And the reason was that would water down their power in the denomination, right? That's why that was done. It's essentially religious gerrymandering uh, is, is, the, is what was happening. Uh, so that was there. Um, the Episcopal uh, Church, uh, you know, historically, uh, you know, was, uh, was, was one that, that uh, at the same time Martin Luther King, like, wrote Letter from Birmingham Jail, published in the Christian Century, which is a mainline denominational uh, magazine. Uh, he was actually an editor-at-large at, at the Christian Century, so they're very invested there in, in King's work. At the same time, um, a private school in Atlanta that was affiliated with the Episcopal Church turned down King's son for admission on the basis of race, right? Um, so there's all this kind of, you know, working. And there, there's, there, ha there is, I should say, um, important shifts, you know, happening here. So, I mean, there's a, there's a very tough history. There's very important shifts happening uh, in the country today. Is there something you're seeing a denomination doing now that um, is... A sign of progress after all the history you just mentioned. Yeah, well, you know, after after Dylan Roof, um, you know, murdered um, parishioners in, in Charleston, um, um, one thing that I think went under the radar that I think is both a challenge and um, a sign of, of hope here is that he was a baptized ELCA Lutheran, right? In his prison journals, uh, he, he had a prison a journal he had in prison. He was sketching crosses and pictures of white Jesus um, in his journal, right? And that was integrated into his like uh, in, into his strategy of starting a race war in the country. I mean it was part his Christian identity was part of that, not separate. 
uh, from it. But the ELCA, as the denomination, came out um, afterward and owned that, right? And really said, like, yes, he is one of ours, and we are going to uh, wrestle with what this means. And and actually, you know, uh, had had education materials produced and and really started. Um, expanding their work, I think, in the racial justice space. I think there has been a responsiveness. I I think Charleston changed things. I think Charlottesville changed things. And I think George Floyd is changing things. And so there was this momentum building up, um, you know, that has been building up over the last five years, especially. Um, And I think what we're seeing today is an unleashing of this pent up energy, right, um, that we have seen. Um, And I think, again, calling the question, um, and it's going to be put to white Christians, um, look, you played a part in building this world um, that's coming down around us in many ways. What part are you going to play in, yes, tearing down things that need to get torn down, but also rebuilding uh, something, something new in the country? So my final question is about, uh, again, going back to Mississippi. You grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and you returned there recently as you were completing your book to the first and only civil rights museum publicly Mm. funded by a state. So as you look back on your childhood church experience and how a museum like that portrays predominantly white and black uh, Christian churches, what strikes you about how far we've come and how far there is to go on the issues we've discussed today? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so first of all, I was surprised. I went in that museum fairly skeptical, having grown up in Mississippi and it being a state-funded institution. But I have to say, it, it's it's a remarkable place. Um, it tells the story without flinching, and it does tell the truth. Um, so it not only has what you might expect, um, you know, a tribute to African American churches and the role they played in organizing the civil rights movement. It has that, but it also has like a pretty honest display of the role that white Christian churches played in the massive resistance to civil rights uh, in, in, in the country. And, you know, and I tell that story a little bit more in, in the book. Um, but, you know, what I think happened is that white Christian churches went from that massive resistance, literally posting deacons as bouncers on the outside of churches to prevent African Americans from coming into worship services um, up into the 1970s. Um, like, this is not that long ago. Um, uh, but I think the shift has been mostly from that to silence. Um, and I think that's the new moment, is that I think silence is no longer going to be acceptable, right? Um, and, I, and I think particularly, when, just in a practical way, um, you know, white Christian churches are, are, are losing members. Um, and, you know, white evangelicals, for example, have gone from a decade ago being 21% of the country to 15% of the country today. Most of the people they've lost, young people. Uh, and young people are not, I think, going to tolerate silence on the issues of racial justice today. Um, so I think just from a pragmatic point of view, much less being the right thing to do uh, from where we are in our history and particularly the role that white Christian churches have played, um, I think the, que- the question is being called and the question is whether uh, white Christian churches are up to answering it. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Robbie. You. Yeah. And I'll leave you to share some of your other final thoughts. Great, thank you. Thanks. So just a couple of um, closing thoughts, and thank you all for being um, with us here. Um, I I do want to just kind of pivot back. I I do think that we're at a moment of reckoning uh, for the the country today uh, on the issue of racial justice. Um, There are signs all around us that the monuments to white supremacy are coming down, whether it is Walmart, NASCAR, and the Mississippi Baptist Convention calling for the removal of the Confederate flag uh, from the state flag, um, uh, or whether it's the statue of Jefferson Davis coming down in Richmond, a uh, very major monument that was founded. And, and really that, that monument was baptized and sacralized by white Christian churches when it was put up in 1907. Uh, and churches actually moved their buildings to be in the shadow of that monument uh, uh, that has just come down in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but I guess where I'd end is that the external monuments to white supremacy in the country are not the only things that were built uh, during that time, we have inherited, we, and now I'm speaking as a white Christian, have inherited a Christianity that was by design built to be compatible with slavery, segregation, and white supremacy. Uh, we've inherited that. It's in the DNA. And the question, I think, for us, um, and I guess what's clear, um, is that we really do have to find the will and the conviction uh, to have the hard conversations, to tell the stories, um, to really rescue the faith, I think, from the distortions that that history um, has brought forward um, to us. Uh, it's certainly the right thing, uh, a necessary thing to do. Um, and I think if we don't find our way to do it, it won't be because it's not possible um, or not necessary, but because we have, I guess, decided um, that we've just been white too long uh, to take the title of the book. Um, so I think the opportunity here, though, is to begin a kind of truth-telling uh, campaign. And that truth, I think, can uh, you know 
in biblical words, set us free, and it can really put us on a journey uh, and a path of reconciliation, a path of justice and repair um, uh, that only uh, truth-telling like that, um, that's a path that only truth-telling can open up. Well, thank you, Robbie and Adele, for leading us in today's conversation. You have provoked our thinking, challenged us, and urged us to take action as a moral imperative. To be clear, our call to action is to work to dismantle white supremacy from our society, from our religion, from ourselves. We do not take on this charge lightly. There is no quick fix. White supremacy is firmly lodged in us and in our institutions, due not only to centuries of atrocities, injustices, and oppression, but also to centuries of ignoring, justifying, and rationalizing it. We at BJC have a unique role to play as a faith-based group, one with Baptist roots across racial and denominational lines that is dedicated to advocating for faith freedom for all. Over the past several years, we have hosted conversations like this one that have helped us explore the intersections of faith freedom and human freedom, the way race and religious liberty interact. The protests for racial justice over the past several weeks have made clear the urgency of our task. We won't have faith freedom for all without racial justice. Just as American Christianity has been white too long, so has our American concept of religious freedom. Adding more diverse voices to our study of and advocacy for religious freedom will only strengthen our support for it. One powerful lesson that comes through in Robbie's work is how American Christianity was used to justify racism, to make a biblical case for the enslavement of black bodies, to shore up terrorism, to perpetuate segregation and Jim Crow laws that created second-class citizenship. The impact of white supremacy on religion, as well as on other aspects of our society, persists in some ways that are rarely noticed or understood. The work to unravel that racism and white supremacy will take many years. It's a project that will require the involvement of a broad and diverse group of Christians. BJC has made the commitment to take on the difficult but necessary work of examining our own institutional history. I'm grateful for the charge the BJC Board of Directors made last fall to examine our history and the work of BJC's Special Committee on Race and Religious Liberty that is ongoing and that will report to our board with recommendations on action this October. A more honest look at history like the one in White Too Long, reveals the ways that Christian denominations allowed themselves to be used for political means by the Confederacy and by those who continued to celebrate its causes throughout the 20th century and to a lesser but still dangerous extent up until the present day. It's an arrangement that has benefited those in power, both religious and political leaders. Oppression has flourished. The vulnerable and marginalized have suffered. So has the integrity of the religion itself. But in addition to learning this history, to analyzing and interrogating the ways white supremacy has impacted our institutions, liturgies, and theologies, to taking actions for, for reparation for racism and the injustices it has perpetuated, we have yet more work to do to ensure religious liberty for all. We must guard against new efforts to co-opt American Christianity for political uses and new efforts that distort religious freedom. In other words, we must firmly reject Christian nationalism. What is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism is a political ideology and cultural framework that seeks to merge American and Christian identities. It suggests that true Christians are Americans and that real Americans are Christian. It demands a privileged place for Christianity in our laws and government. It ignores foundational principles that protect faith freedom for all. Christian nationalism acts a lot like racism. It's pervasive, insidious, and infects all aspects of American life. It feeds on a carefully curated and white-centered version of history. Just like racism, we are all impacted by Christian nationalism, no matter our race, ethnicity, gender, or religion.
The way it shows up for us, though, varies by our perspective, experience, and identity. And Christian nationalism in the hands of white Christians, particularly those who feel threatened by changing culture and a perceived loss of power, can be very dangerous to those who are out of power, to the disenfranchised and vulnerable. Christian nationalism can be violent and even deadly, like the attack on Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston five years ago, or the attack on Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018. But oftentimes, those most extreme examples can distract us from the more mundane, everyday examples that are just as dangerous to our society because they are so embedded in it. Earlier this month, we saw a display of Christian nationalism on the national stage when President Trump staged a photo op using a Bible as a prop and St. John's Church as a backdrop, just blocks from where we are right now in D.C. The fact that peaceful protesters, including clergy and seminarians, were violently cleared from the space by the church to make room for the stunt is not only hypocritical, but also intensifies the harm of the misuse of the Bible and the church in this instance. There was a swift and emphatic rejection of the event by many religious leaders, including Bishop Marian Buddy of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. But we cannot ignore that some religious leaders embraced and applauded the co-opting of religious symbols by the president. If those of us who call ourselves Christians do not distance ourselves from the misuse of our faith for political reasons, we risk not only tarnishing Christianity's reputation with the general public, but distorting the gospel of Jesus beyond recognition. This kind of power broker Christianity has been used to perpetuate racial subjugation for generations and has contributed greatly to the trauma and pain in our streets right now. Christians have a choice now about which side they will be on, the oppressed or the oppressors. And I believe we saw that choice made in various reactions to the president's photo op. We have also seen that choice made by thousands of Christians who have joined Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Last year, we at BJC, working in concert with a number of other religious groups, launched this nationwide grassroots movement of Christians who reject Christian nationalism as a distortion of our faith and as a threat to our country. We deliberately labeled this initiative as exclusive to Christians, not because we think non-Christians don't have a role to play in the public conversation and work to dismantle white supremacy. To the contrary, our statement explicitly affirms that people of all faiths and none have the right and responsibility to engage constructively in the public square. We also assert that one's religious affiliation or lack thereof should be irrelevant to one's standing in the civic community. These are core meanings of the expansive concept of religious freedom that BJC works tirelessly to promote. But this work of rejecting Christian nationalism must be led by those of us who profess to be Christ followers, just as the work of dismantling white supremacy must be largely borne by white Americans after listening to and learning from our brothers and sisters of color. Christians Against Christian Nationalism has been endorsed by a broad and diverse cross-section of American Christian life. BJC has led this movement because it falls squarely within our mission to advocate for faith freedom for all. As we reject the premise that the United States was founded as a Christian nation to privilege Christianity over other religions, we affirm the American ideals of religious freedom for all, with a government that remains neutral when it comes to religion. We believe that the best antidote to the poison of Christian nationalism is an abiding commitment to an expansive protection of faith freedom for all. I invite everyone watching to visit ChristiansAgainstChristianNationalism.org. Read our statement of principles. If you're a Christian, sign the statement and go on record with your opposition to Christian nationalism and the way it provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. Share the statement with your networks. Start conversations about Christian nationalism. Use the 10-part podcast series on Christian nationalism available on the BJC podcast to learn more and to host dialogue. 
and stay in touch with us at BJC as we continue to explore these necessary and hard conversations in the weeks and months to come and continue to work with others to build a strong movement of Christians against Christian nationalism. The conversation is just beginning. BJC's Director of Education, Charles Watson Jr., is hosting a Facebook Live discussion with Dr. Alfonso Seville of Georgetown University immediately following our program here on BJC's Facebook page. Go to facebook.com slash religious liberty. If you do not have a CBF General Assembly workshop to attend now, I hope you will join the conversation on Facebook Live immediately following this event. Robust Faith Freedom for All provides the foundation for advocacy work for justice in our greater world. I invite you to join BJC and keep up with our work. Visit bjconline.org slash subscribe to sign up for our email list and receive regular updates from us, including ways that you can make a difference. We will hear now from a few members of our BJC community about what faith freedom means for them now in 2020 in the midst of pandemic and a national reckoning with racism. I'm so grateful for their advocacy, and I'm grateful that you are with us in this critical moment for freedom and faith. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be speaking with you today, broadcasting live to your kitchen table, to the previously unused nook by the garage, or maybe the couch by the air conditioner. While I agree that I'd rather see all of your faces here in Washington, DC, I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak to you on such an unparalleled scale. Some of you may know me, but I imagine many of you do not. My name is Sophie Hersher, and I am a member of the BJC Board of Directors. I'm also not Baptist. I'm actually not even Christian. I'm Jewish. Let me tell you why that matters. There was a time in my life when I thought that all Christians hated me. When I was nine years old, I watched my synagogue burn to the ground at the hands of two Christian nationalists espousing a radical white supremacist vision for America. My memories of that time are hazy and confusing, but there is light in the darkness. I remember the Sacramento Convention Center packed to the gills with supportive interfaith neighbors. It was a very, very difficult summer, but it was our Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, and Sikh neighbors who sustained us. This experience stuck with me, and in the summer of 2017, I approached Charles Watson Jr. and either confused or convinced the BJC to let me join as the first non-Christian BJC fellow. I was captivated by BJC's dogged pursuit of religious liberty. I understood the argument from a minority faith's point of view, but if I'm honest, I couldn't really understand why a majority group would be so keen to cede its power in the public square. Then I started listening, and I learned. And I learned, and I learned, and I learned. I learned that for BJC, it's not about power, but faith. I learned that being a Baptist is super, super complicated, but absolutely requires each person to work to preserve soul freedom. That we must all be able to determine for ourselves how to live authentically in faith, and that the best way to do this is to work together. Fast forward to October 2018, um, after another act of violence in an American synagogue. The first four messages of support I received were from BJC fellows and staff some of whom I'm sure are watching right now, and some of whom are here in this room. Each person, in their own way, assured me that my liberation is bound with theirs, that no person of faith is safe until all people of faith are safe, that no one is free until everyone is free. This remains more true now than ever, by the way. So here I am today asking you to join me in supporting an organization that works tirelessly to realize this vision for America. BJC exists to protect and extend religious liberty for all, to combat intolerance, to combat the weaponization of Christian nationalism, to bring us together and to build a better, more just world. In a few moments, you will receive a text message. Open it up and click on the link to visit BJC's secure giving page. There, I invite you to make, 
<clears throat> to make a gift to support the imperative work of BJC. BJC works for religious liberty in the Supreme Court, in Congress, in state and local governments, and in educating houses of worship and individuals about faith freedom. This work has real and lasting effects. Just ask any member of B'nai Israel Synagogue in Sacramento, California. If you didn't agree to receive a text, you can visit the BJC website, bjconline.org, and click the button to invest in religious liberty for all. For Amanda, for me, for my nine-year-old self, for your children, and for all of us, I hope you'll join us in community and consider making a gift today. We put a few thoughts together on the value and impact of this incredible community. Take a look. If there's a valuable freedom that we take for granted, I think it is our religious liberty. Religious freedom is one of those foundational freedoms for all of us. Sometimes we don't appreciate and the need for it until it starts to crumble in some way. One of my motivations in the work that I do is that I really want to be someone who is able to contribute to conversations around justice, conversations around faith, and again, how those things intersect. When you say hospital chaplain, what comes to mind is people in hospital gowns, uh, lying in beds with lots of white sheets and tubes. But that's perhaps the smallest part of what I do. When I think back to my internship with BJC, I got a chance to really explore, just to get a sense of how this legacy of fighting for religious freedom sort of ties into this really important conversation about justice and freedom and equity for all people. We can certainly look around the world and see so many people who are uh, being religiously persecuted right now. But we also can't take for granted that freedom here in our country and know that our First Amendment guarantees are only as valuable as our advocacy for them. We are moving away from a sense of church that is so bounded by four walls of the building, four walls of the institution, and we're really shifting back towards the ecclesia, where people are, you know, out in the street, where people are, you know, free to move uh, in order to share and be in relationship and community with one another. When I hear the word uh, community in English, in Spanish, the first word that pops into my mind is the word uh, compañerismo and it actually means fellowship. More and more of our churches, especially our, our younger pastors that are getting into the ministry, are looking at the importance of our churches having that compañerismo, that fellowship uh, outside of the church. There's something of value or something of importance in proximity, you know, and being near people and rooted in community with people and how that pours into you and how that informs you and how that shapes you in order to, to make a more authentic sort of approach to ministry. I get to sit and listen and just to be present to my world. The patients will say, oh, uh, what church do you work at? Or where do you minister? And I'll say to them, this is my parish. And as Latinos, we tend to be very good at loving the Lord with all of our heart. Our services are passionate and our work is passionate. And we love the Lord with all of our hands. You know, our, the people in our churches, they work, they sacrifice. But one of the areas where I think we challenge our pastors is to love the Lord with all their mind, to, to learn about other ministries, to think about how some of the members in their churches might have a heart uh, and a passion for things like religious liberty or justice. It is really important that people of faith, people of conscience, people of goodwill respond in a moment such as this. How do we do a better job in our churches of, of auditing and examining our theologies, our institutions, our infrastructures, uh, to get a sense of how these things have perpetuated these systems that we see? And the beauty is when we look at people in the street, we really are seeing the church in action. It's as people are taken to the street as an act of freedom, as an act of protest, uh, as, an, as an act of faith. Now, siblings in Christ, hear these words of benediction as we go and continue our life in this world. Remember that our God is a God of fire. Remember 
the fire. Remember the fire that invited Moses in and commanded him to be a liberator. Remember the fires that surrounded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and remember the divine protection that they had as the flames rose. Remember the fire summoned by Elijah as he told the people of God that they could not waver between two ideologies, idols and God. People of faith, we must not waver between the idol of Christian nationalism and the liberating truth of God's love. Remember the low light of the campfire Jesus used to invite his friends in for sustenance. And remember the fires of Pentecost. Remember that the fire led the disciples to speak truth. Remember that they did not stop proclaiming the good news in the upper room that day. And so in these days, as we slow down and have more time to listen to the cries of injustice, May God give us hearts that burn for justice. May we remember the life of Jesus that reminded us to flip narratives, to flip the power, and to, yes, flip the tables. And may the Holy Spirit move us from holy discomfort to holy action. And may we truly believe and proclaim that black lives matter. May it be so. Now, today we will continue the conversation, and I invite you to continue to hear the dialogue hosted today by B the Baptist Joint Committee's Charles Watson, Jr. Um, I invite you to see the dialogue between him and Dr. Alfonso F. Seville the Fourth, a professor from Georgetown University, and that is happening on the BJC Facebook page um, right after this. And so I invite you to join us as we continue the dialogue together. Thank you. <laughs> 